Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Dark Diaspora Africa Renaissance channel. I'm your host, Ego, and I have with me Namdi and Baruti. All right. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hello, everyone. Whoops. So I had another channel up. Okay. All right. Thank you all for tuning in. All right. We'll get straight into it. So, the. Uh, what we wanted to discuss today is the colonizing the African mind. Um, the colonization uh, has um, different definitions. Uh, first of all, the colonization is defined in terms of the independence of certain countries or peoples from their former imperial powers, um, whereby they are now uh, ridding themselves of the control of the uh, former imperial powers. But what we're talking about is slightly different. We're talking about the colonization of the mind, of the African mind in particular. Um, when the colonization happened, the uh, former countries, and we'll pick the um, United, United Kingdom um, in particular, went around the world and implanted their own um, systems, language, uh, beliefs, structures in those countries um, ridding the peoples of their own original culture, original way of life, original practices, belief, uh, um, belief systems, um, um, rituals, um, um, religions, deities, etc. This happened in India, uh, the Aborigines in Australia, in South America, and in Africa. Um, so this went over a period of uh, about. 200 years, and obviously 400 years from slavery. Um, and then the country started to fight for their independence, uh, which they gained around the 50s and 60s in, in Africa. Um, and then uh, there was a celebration. Uh, but soon after, uh, the countries didn't um, embark on a, a drive to really rid themselves of everything that they had learned over the past uh, few centuries. Um, and why uh, are we looking into this topic? Uh, because we believe that there are uh, deep-rooted and insidious um, um, consequences of the lack of that action, which we're still dealing with today. Um, and we're going to delve into that. So uh, by saying that, I'll just try and give a, um, a brief um, a few pointers that we're going to be looking at. We're going to be talking about uh, what is decolonization, um, uh, the uh, features of a colonized mind, um, how to decolonize uh, the self, how to decolonize people, um, um, the educational system, how um, colonization, how that has been colonized, and the need for that to be decolonized, what that looks like, um, and um, and any other uh, issues that may come as, as we discuss the show. So uh, I'll put the question to you, um, to gentlemen. What what do you uh, both understand by uh, decolonization, first of all? So I'll start with Baruti. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly all of the dynamics of decolonization because I guess to decolonize is to um, sort of dismantle what what a colony is. So uh, one of the things I'd like to know is what what a colony is, and then to decolonize. Then I know kind of the the opposite action to colonialize versus to decolonize. However, in saying that, I wanted to um, just read a paragraph from a book called Decolonizing the Mind. Uh, by Ngugi Wa Thiongo. and for our audience, of course, um, he is a very famous, um, you know, Kenyan uh, writer, and uh, this is called Decolonizing the Mind, The Politics of Language in African African Literature, and I'm going to just read this paragraph, and maybe um, my question about what is a colony can be addressed by, by you gentlemen in reaction, perhaps, as the show goes on, about uh, what I've read from Ngugi Watiango. Uh, from this book on page 17, um, he, he says, uh, but since the new imposed languages 
could never completely break the native languages as spoken, their most effective area of domination was the third aspect of language as, as communication, the written. So he's talking about foreign uh, European languages uh, imposing its will in a third area uh, of language called the written. The language of an African child's formal education was, fo was foreign. The language of the books he read was foreign. The language of his conceptualization was foreign. Thought in him took the visible form of a foreign language. So the written language of a child's upbringing in school, even a spoken language within the school compound became divorced from his spoken language at home. There was often not the slightest relationship between the child written world, which was also the language of his schooling and the world of his immediate environment in the family and the community. For a colonial child, the harmony existing between the three aspects of language as communication was irrevocably broken. This resulted in the disassociation of the sensibility of that child from his natural and social environment, what we might call colonial alienation. The alienation became reinforced in the teaching of history, geography, music, where bourgeois Europe was always the center of the universe. Just one more sentence. This disassociation, divorce, or alienation from the immediate environment became clearer when you look at colonial language as a center of the carrier of culture. Since culture is a product of the history of a people where it in turn reflects, the child was now being exposed exclusively to a culture that was the product of a world external to himself. So somehow or another, whatever colonization was or is, it makes the colonized look outside themselves in a narrative about themselves, about how they think, about the sourcing of how to solve their own problems. They always look outside as opposed to within. So I think there might be applications um, about how we look at ourselves and see no way that we can create immediate solution for us because we're always looking outside because we have no solution and a positive narrative from within. And and, and, and just to say, thank you, thank you for reading that. That, that that's quite a um, a mammoth um, a mammoth statement. There, I think that encapsulates itself with the large large, large part of the problems we have on the African continent today. Um, th th there is no, or there doesn't appear to be any historical backing that we can pull from or that we know of uh, or that we have conceptualized to solve problems. I mean, th there are some instances where we can see that some natural historical um, 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 cultural aspects of us are used to solve problems, but not on the scales of massive development. Not to say we haven't had that before, we have. It is in our history, but a lot of it has been turned upside down and inside out that all we see now and the way we think and conceptualize is in the same thoughts as our former colonizers, and we only look to them for solutions for everything. Um, now, the, how, how, from what Baruti read, how do you see that that's affected us so far? It has, it has affected us significantly. And I, 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 like, like you mentioned earlier on, we, we are still still not recovered from the process. Um, I mean, a lot of people think that, you know, when African nations got independence in the 60s, they, they thought that was just it. You know, they were then, they were then free from colonial domination. They, um, they could now, you know, do things on their own. But uh, I think no one actually looked at the, the lingering uh, or the mental effects 
colonization had on the people, um, from the way the people acted, from the way they spoke, um, to the way their institutions were structured. You know, they were essentially colonial. As a matter of fact, I don't even like to use the word colonial because I think that the we are not really in a we still are not in a post-colonial era. We are in a new colonial era because the institutions and the systems, um, including the language that Baruti talked about and Ngobu Wationgo wrote uh, um, wrote extensively in his book, are still largely modeled in the image of the colonizers. And what are the effects? If, if, if the effect psychologically is that um, from, a, from, a, from a psychological point of view, uh, our consciousness is still modeled in a truly lens, true and true and eucentric lens um, because of the kind of exposure that we've had um, via these various um, channels that I talked about earlier. So we ingest we read and we absorb the consciousness of the materials of uh, of uh, our former colonizers, which essentially makes us, which, which manifests, uh, you know, in such a way that we begin to act and behave in the likeness and image of our former colonizers, essentially like zombies, like European zombies. Um, people who have been totally annihilated or removed from their environment. They are still, they are, they are, although they are physically present in their environment, but their thought process and the way they act, um, it's, it's, it's totally alien from the environment where they live. Um, yeah. Now, that, now, now some, some people, majority, mainly white people and some black people will say, is this not an excuse? It is not just making up excuses for lack of development. I mean, they'll point to uh, countries. They like to use this one a lot to say, look at Singapore. Uh, they were colonized. Um, look at uh, China. At some point, they were colonized. Look at a few countries around the world who have since independence, since the 60s, have managed to achieve uh, economic um, 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 advancement. So someone asked the question, what are Africans complaining about? Why, why, why can't we get ourselves out of that same situation that other peoples um, went through as well? Now, now what, what, what would we say to that? Because that argument is banded about on social media, um, on, on forums, in, in, in articles and newspapers. They blame things like, you know, it's people, it's actual corruption, or some of them would go as far as to say. It's due to um, a, a lower level of IQ. That's another one that, that, that's used. They give all sorts of reasons except colonialism. So, is there any is there any is, is there any way to to rebut those people, or do we need to go further into this conversation to to really define and draw out what um what the impacts of of, of colonization still does and how it still pervades our our, our psyche. I think it's very straightforward. I mean, I, I don't think the, the experiences that um, Africans and Asians have uh, are, are totally different. I mean, Africans went through centuries of slavery, enslavement, um, and after that cycle was completed, they will now went through another phase of colonization. And this colonization essentially means uh, a totally decimation of the, the institutions and the systems. Um, that this 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 um, that, the, that the continent, that the African continent, and the population had, and the replacement and the imposition, replacement and the imposition of an alien system, an alien language and an alien system um, that have remained ever since, even till today. But in Asia, that wasn't really the case. The Asia just went through a brief spell of colonization, and even at that, um, their systems were largely preserved. Um, the traditional system was largely preserved. So when they got independence from their colonial, from the, from their colonizers, it enabled them to take off because their systems were still largely intact. You know, the traditional systems, their languages were not in, were not interrupted. Even their, their religion, you know, their belief system, their faith system, were not largely destroyed. They were still largely preserved. You know, so enabled them 
you know, when they go in there, when they finally got their independence, it enabled them to, to take off. In our own case, uh, you know, after undergoing centuries of, ens of, of, of enslavement, of slavery, then, uh, you know, another, another centuries again of colonization, uh, the first round of enslavement uh, with the Arabs, then the Europeans, and each of them bringing in their own institutions. You know, there, there are parts of Africa today that we see uh, that there are Muslim, predominantly by Muslim population, and they speak predominantly Arabic, and they act and behave like like the Arabs, even though they are Africans or Blacks, you know, but they identify more as the Arabs. It goes back to that consciousness I was talking about. The Dr. Ibn Tusito wrote about this extensively in his book. So the consciousness, so they have the consciousness of the Arabs. They see themselves more as Arabs. Then you see another part of the continent that were enslaved and colonized by the Europeans act and behave like the, coloni uh, like the, like the European colonizers. And, you know, and a fragmentation, you know, a severe flag fragmentation on the continent, Spanish, English, French, Portuguese, you know, all having their various systems and the institutions introduced into the into the continent, you know, and, uh, and also another round again of colonization. You can see, so you can't compare the kind of, um, uh, you know, the kind of experiences Africans have with that of with that of without Asia, and I don't think that you can compare it. So, this is the reason why it's taking us much taking us much longer to recover, and even even up till now, we still haven't recovered, because, like I mentioned earlier on, we are not contrary to what we think. We are not in a post-colonial era. We are still in a neo-colonial era, because we still have the institutions that uh, the colonizers introduced into the continent still very visible they were not um, destroyed or removed uh, they were rather they were rather preserved by a new class of leaders that took over when the colonizers left so when the colonizers left they put in place new sets of leaders who then went as far as preserving all the various institutions including the languages of the colonizers to ensure that the system that the, the that the colonizers set up were largely preserved I, I, so, so sorry, I just want to pick up um, a, a comment on on the on, in the chat room. Um, Davy said um, um, that, that you're right, but he said blacks everywhere seem to believe in leaders more than systems. That we focus a lot more on leaders instead of systems. Mm -hmm. uh, Baruti, <laughs> do, do you have any 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 comments on that? Uh yes. Do we? We concentrate more on leaders than systems. That seems to be that we um, get sort of what I would say enamored with with personalities, charisma of personalities, as opposed to overall systems and ideas that sort of um, extend beyond the life of a particular charismatic leader. So it's almost with us that. Once a charismatic leader is killed, assassinated, or, or, or dies, then we have to restart again with, um, with ideas to build the entire community, as opposed to us having a set of concepts um, that we adhere to beyond the charisma of a particular leader. And I think that's an area where we have got to... Um, you know, strengthen our ideas. It's about it's about philosophy, by the way. Okay, speaking of philosophy and ideas and concepts, you know, that, that we can pull on that are authentically ours. I think we need language for these. Now, now, a, a major issue that has has plagued us has been the language. Right now, we're speaking to each other in the English language. Right. Um, none of us are Anglo-Saxon. Last, last time I I, <laughs> I said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but 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 we we know know how it happened. So even though it happened centuries ago, um, our great great grandparents taught had to have, were in, in a system where they had to teach their children and teach their children and teach us eventually. And now we are speaking in that language, conceptualizing in that language. Uh, when we look for solutions, the texts that have already been uh, formatted and formulated are in that language and are owned by the former colonizers. So. This then always draws you back 
to going to them for a solution to your problems. Now, this is, I think, a, a point that was um, obviously raised in um, Gugi Wationgo's book. Um, but why why is it that post or the, the new colonial era or the independence era that we hadn't or this was not an issue that was addressed adequately at that stage. Uh, I well, go, go, so, go on. Uh, I, I, I have because, on. because, like I said, after independence, that would have been the best time for us to uh, address or begin to dismantle those uh, colonial institutions and replace them with, or go through a process of decolonization. Um, but unfortunately, in most African countries. We did not go through that phase. Rather, I think we just caught up with the whole euphoria of uh, independence and you know, the, you know, and our, our our sheer determination to prove to our former colonizers that we can we can captain our own ship. That we didn't really go through that phase of of decolonization. Every great civilization uh, supposed to go through that that phase of decolonization. I mean, if you look at the Chinese after they kicked the Europeans out of china they went through a phase of decolonization with the great leap for, forward and the cultural revolution and they essentially saw the uh, the uh, the the eviction of 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 neo-colonial agents in china into the country that we don't know as taiwan so a lot of people we see in taiwan were people who were living in mainland china who were keen to preserve the institutions that the um, the the english and the french had initially set up but it, because of the, obviously with the sheer determination of the likes of Mao Zedong and other leaders of the, uh, the Chinese Revolution, they were able to evict those new colonial agents. They were still largely resident, uh, residents in, in China, and we see the same thing also in other parts of, of of Asia. But on the African continent, we didn't. The likes of uh, Kwame Nkrumah and Julius Nyerere made attempt at the initial phase to to go through that decolonization process, but obviously. Uh, we all know what happened to Kwame Nkrumah. Um, Julius Nyerere equally tried uh, as what well, as much, but I don't know. How, I don't think the efforts that he made in the decolonization project. I don't know. I don't think was as was as significant. But overall, in most African countries, we did not go through that phase of decolonization. Um, rather, when the when the from, when the when the colonizers left, like I, I talked about earlier. We had new sets of leaders that essentially had been trained by the colonizers to replace them. So what we just saw was just a, a change of guard, what we had on the continent was essentially in most cases like a change of guard. Um, the Europeans left, but we had new sets of nationalist bourgeoisie leaders who essentially still had the consciousness, who still had this Eurocentric consciousness, who still thought and acted like the colonizers. So this is this this. This, I think, explains the reason why we see African leaders, some African leaders who can inflict so much pain on their own people, you know, so much barbarism. They can, uh, you know, they can incarcerate their people, they can jail them, they can, they can order for their execution. We know, we know, with no sense of empathy at all because they are totally annihilated from their own people. They don't see their own people as theirs, you know, they have like, a virus, like a, a conscious, an alien consciousness within them, and they tend to see their former colonizers as their own allies, even though they call up the former colonizers don't see them as their own allies. You know, Franz Fanon explains this perfectly in his book for Wretch of the Earth. So it explains this dichotomy and explains um, the, uh, uh, the you know the, the the sequence of events that happen shortly after events and the psychology around the. Um, the new set of African leaders that took over after independence and their mindset that still exists today. Sorry, I just, I just wanted to mention uh, another yeah. France, France Fanon book is a uh, Black Skin White Masks, yeah. which which is which is another one that that, that, that gives some um, so some context as well with um, people who have that particular uh, uh, mindset. But sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead, Barry, you were going to say something. Oh, I just wanted to add a, a couple of comments. Uh, the first one is, is that, you know, I'm glad we're talking about language because sometimes that is an, what I would call an under discussed subject in terms of power and, and impact. I, I want to say that um, 
and Gugi Watiango was actually jailed for uh, some years in Kenya in late 1960s, early 1970s, because he advocated uh, the construction of uh, community theaters in different locations in Kenya, of which the language in these parts of community uh, theaters would be um, Kikuyu, which was um, you know his, uh, his his mother tongue, and uh, that was feared by the early post-colonial uh, government because they thought that his insistence on speaking in in, in Kikuyu in those uh, community theaters represented sometime, something that was anti the government and a way of um, challenging the government and blocking out ideas of propaganda that the government wished to uh, unveil upon the people. And I wanna say that one of the things that um, Professor Ngugi has, has said in his books and writings and uh, even speeches is that language indigenous to particular populations have a way of recentering the uh, indigenous population into a narrative of themselves. That as long as they're not thinking consciously about the about the aspects of language, uh, their own language, they can't be recentered amongst themselves in terms of the way that they think. So they always are operating outside of themselves to depend upon an alien culture for, for everything. Their process of thought, possibly solutions, and also a definition of themselves. And having said that, um, he defines in the same book that I had uh, started out um, a few sentences for at the beginning of the show. He says there are three aspects of language, and I want to just read them. He says um, the three aspects of language are the language of real life, speech, that's the second one, and the written. So now we're dealing with sound in the speech, we're dealing with written in terms of what we physically see as, as, as words and sentences on paper. But the first one I think is very interesting, the language of real life. There he's talking about communication as a language based upon the modeling of behaviors. And he's saying that the modeling of behaviors is a core element of how communities uh, function. If we look at communities where we can visibly see how production operates, the delineation of work and affairs as done by men, women, children, distinctly amongst those groups and in the collective. So basically the modeling of behaviors is a type of language. So we imitate what you know what we what we see and one more one more point is um now that you mentioned something about uh julius Nereri, first uh president of tanzania who will always be known to most people as walimu so whenever we say walimu we know that that immediately is a kiswahili term for a teacher and i think that uh Walimu's greatest and long lasting impact on Tanzania was the institution instituting of Kiswahili amongst the various people. We realized that Tanzania post-colonially had lots and lots of ethnic groups, almost nearly 80 ethnic groups in the immediate uh, area of what we now know as, as Tanzania. And so he wanted to attempt to unite various people under an indigenous African language so that they could recenter themselves as a narrative to each other. And he felt like that would help to avert tribalism and eventual war. And I think that was successful, even though 
some of his economic ideas, uh, such as the Ujamaa program, has been critiqued. But the idea was to get what would become known as Tanzania, uh, of getting people to believe in the nation state as opposed to ethnic identity as a narrative of oneself so that we could begin the process of interacting as an as African people in that space as Tanzanians, as opposed to Kikuyu, Maasai, Kikamba, et cetera, Luo. Um, I think that was very important. And in this type of uh, integration of using Kiswahili, of which, of which Tanzania is one of the few, there are a handful of African countries that have averted uh, you know, warfare in their total um, time of, of being post-colonial. But Tanzania sticks out as a country that has not had, you know, political warfare because people believe in the nation state. Also, it should be noted that Tanzania itself is a combination of a couple of words. Before colonialism ended, the mainland was called Tanganyika, and the offshore island was Zanzibar. And so in the formulation of what would become Tanzania is a combination of the two words, Tanganyika, we're taking the Tan, and then Zanzibar, Za, Tanzania. And that's how the country came about underneath the banner of Swahili being used to integrate the people on the island, which were primarily Muslim, Zanzibar, and also uh, on the mainland to at least make some attempt at, at unification. And the idea that just, just because Tanzania might not be wealthy in terms of an economy early in the post-colonial uh, history, that did not mean that because you were not materially wealthy, that that meant that you need to destroy the government that you need to fight your neighbor or your brother or your or your sister, and that even if you were poor, you had a dignity and narrative about yourself that was African that would uh, supersede whatever the economic or political circumstances that you were in. Thank you, Rosie. Um, um, whilst we're on, uh, just want to give one more point on language and we'll move on to an another aspect of this decolonization we're speaking about. Um, language as well, I think um, to, for some people, uh, I think they undermine its importance. I want to just make a, a reference to to Japanese. The, the Japanese language uh, doesn't have some languages that you can find in the English language. In other words, you cannot translate some words in the, in the English language or some con concepts into Japanese language. An example is uh, good luck. So. The Japanese language doesn't have good luck. Their closest, um, the closest uh, uh, similarity to that is something called gambate, which is, which translates to try hard or try your best, but it has nothing to do with luck at all. So that, that's just that's just one of them. And and why that could be important when you have words that um, translate from or, or have have a meaning of a veneration of supernatural. Or things that would would be be more clairvoyant, or something that can help you spirit, spiritually in a way that the English have determined themselves, and you now take that on. You tell someone good luck, whereas the Japanese don't have that. They have try hard or try your best. So that's just one of the kind of nuances and how language can can stimulate a mindset and a thinking and a way of appreciating your environment and how you can manipulated to suit your, your needs. Another word, uh, uh, another set of words again, um, that they don't have in Japanese language, uh, if, uh, they don't have a, uh, you know, when people sneeze, they go, bless you. Um, they don't have uh, bless you. They don't have that word called bless you in the language. Um, uh, they have, uh, uh, as another language, I miss you, uh, which is the English language, I miss you. In Japan, they have, they have something called uh, eitai, which is want to, I want to meet or uh, I will become lonely. They, they, they have that, but they don't have I miss you, you know. Um, and there's several others. Uh, there's ones like uh, I'm so proud, like proud. 
Um, in Japanese, they have uh, something called seiyata, which is I did it, or something like that. So, so they're very positive uh, affirmation uh, um, backed words that they have in the Japanese language that conceptualize from their history and their heritage that they use to project their consciousness. Whereas we are not using our words, so we're not projecting our consciousness. We're not projecting the appreciation of our environment and how to um, live within it. We are now, as Nandi said, we are zombies. We are thinking of an environment that is outside ours. I mean, right now, kids and children are being taught the alphabets A to Z. And most of the time in Africa, they say A for apple. And apples don't grow <laughs> in many parts of the African continent. But children keep saying A for apple, B for B, and C for it could be something else. But they keep saying A for apple when many children, majority, have never seen an apple before in their life. This is colonialism. This is where, when the word should be a local word they use for A, or A for Africa. But that's not even used. It's always and still is A for apple. The products, the, the, the memorabilia, the, the, the boards, uh, the pamphlets, everything is written in a language, conceptualized of, of something that's foreign to them. Even some of the words that we're using now to describe how we feel, we have no concept or context of where it came from. We even have some people in, in the governments who speak Latin on the African continent to each other. These are people who are arguing in House of Representatives political spheres, and now he's laughing, political spheres, and they speak Latin to each other. They even go one further, they're speaking Latin to each other in Houses of Parliament on the African continent. Now, you can see where the confusion comes from, where the expression is never going to be one where you can, you can think of something for yourself, by yourself, that is, that is unique to you and your people. And your people and, and their needs. Mm. There's, some, there's some things that you're unable to express or explain. That There, there are no words for it in a foreign language. Mm. Um, I don't want to go too much on language. I think we'll do another show, especially on language in particular, and drill down some of these words and how they have certain powers that we are not utilizing, we're missing, or we are using ones that are completely opposite to us. The, the, the African people who use the word nappy, to describe their hair. Mm -hmm. They call themselves nappy. They have nappy hair. Mm -hmm. You know, this, 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 these are words that people use to describe themselves. Mm -hmm. And there, there, there's so many of them. There's so many of them. So the, 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 the context of teaching children should be to empower them to be the next generation. And we're going to now, we're going to now get into the curriculum and the educational system to empower children to be able to conceptualize and solve problems. That's the whole point of mm -hmm. the language. But you cannot solve a problem with a concept that you I, do not create alien. but that comes from that's alien to you. Alien I, concept. Yeah. I, I wanna I wanna ask a question. Do, do you all think that language in all of its forms preserves philosophy? Mm -hmm. Oh ab ab absolutely yeah absolutely Absolutely, and then when you when you have translations of some of these um, 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 proverbs, they get lost. They get lost in translation. Yeah, they get lost in translation. Just just the same way that the the Bible has been translated, or the Quran. When they get translated into another language, you lose some elements and some context, and it gets misinterpreted along mm -hmm. the way. And then when it gets misinterpreted, you then lose the message, and we we have lost the message, and 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 it doesn't seem as if. Anyone is focusing on this, uh, those who are in positions to focus on now, now about about schooling, about education now. Um, on the African continent, uh, we're seeing we've seen a proliferation of what they call international schools. So you go, you see things like British International School, uh, uh, you have French International Schools. Now you even have Chinese institutions now, uh, Confucianism schools. And all these schools on the continent, and they are deemed um, higher of a higher caliber than the actual um, schools that we have on the continent. And because we are already speaking the English language, naturally they would be deemed of a higher caliber because you cannot 
be able to to teach or to learn in a language better than the people who are the originators of that language itself. So, so, so you will never be able to compete with those schools. You now have a selection of people who are rushing to try and get themselves into those schools because they feel they will get a higher and better level of education. So this brings me to um, an African-centered form of education. Does any exist on the continent? What what does it look like? What would it look like? Um, has, has there, has, have, have any attempts been made at that one? Um, and what would the benefits be if we if, if we had that? So I just I just wanted to put that out there, and then those in the um, comment section as well. Um, if you, if you, if you want to ask me questions or make any suggestions, please do. Um, so an African centered educational system. I want us to explore that. What what do you think? What do you think the features would be? What would it contain? Problem solving. I think problem solving is one of the main features that should be emphasized. Problem solving using uh, indigenous ideas, technology, um, indigenous concepts uh, amongst African people to solve immediate problems. And to me, that goes back to the idea of what I said that Professor Ngugi uh, Watiango pointed out that, you know, even within the idea of, of language, of course, but we can extend language to what is written, what is seen, what is modeled in behavior to preserve a, a philosophy kind of ideas of thought should be the idea that all of this should help to recenter you so that the genius of you, the ideas that you have about empowerment come from within your thought patterns uh, as opposed to being outside of you. So when you become the center, then you think that you can be a, a problem solver. So I think that that would be one of the central roots of any type of uh, Afrocentric school that is designed to teach written speech and behavioral modeling. And, and, and now I'm going to put this to you, because I know we had this conversation sometime recently, where, whereby I think a survey was done or study, and children who, in, in the African continent, who were speaking the indigenous languages, um, at the performance before they got to a school system where they first had to unlearn their language, stop learning English, and then get tested in English, and the performance dropped. You know, you know. So, so you, you're, you're instead of allowing the child, as opposed to children in the other parts of the world and other countries, to be able to learn in their language, problem solve in their language, um, uh, and then and then uh, communicate in their language. They're first having to learn another language, which is hard enough to become mm -hmm. proficient at first, and then to try and problem solve in that language. Exactly. Which, which, which 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 doesn't make sense does it? it doesn't make sense exactly which doesn't make sense but this is this is a this is a system that we have um prevalent you know across across the continent so you know the students have to learn how to speak you know in you know a European language French Portuguese Spanish English as a prelude before they you know get into formal formal schooling and it, was, and it has been shown studies have been done on this and the studies demonstrate that this definitely has an impact on the overall development of a child. You know, so it does it does slow down the rate of development of children, you know, when they are when they are made to, to learn how to speak a foreign language first before they are now, you know, formal form of education begins. But I don't think it's just about the education itself, the curriculum itself. You know, we even for the for the way the curriculum is structured too, has to equally go through the colonization process. And when you read books and all you all you, all you read about in all you read about in the books are people of of of, of European descent. You never read anybody uh, in terms of the schooling process, the academic process, you never read or come across anybody that looks like you uh, or resembles you. Uh, it's always about people of a of far distant land in another continent that pale skin or white, 
that have done remarkable things. You know, it, it may have an impact on children psychologically because you know it makes the child think, oh, does it mean my people have never contributed anything? You know, but when it when a when an educational system undergoes the decolonization process, then we can then begin to introduce some of the concepts like Baruti talked about, some of the concepts or local concepts and pioneers of those concepts into the curriculum. And Europe went through this phase. Europe went through this phase. Because the subjects that we see today, actually some of the subjects that we see that are being taught in Europe today, even though they don't mention it extensively in their curriculum, actually have some Arabic, like we know the words uh, arithmetic, right? Has Arabic uh, origins. The same thing with um, algebra and um, and some other you know, subject subject areas. I can't remember all of them when we talk by hand. But you see, mention of their Arabic origin has been totally wiped off. You don't you don't actually get to even hear about any European scholar talk about that. Only when you research or do more investigation as to the origin of this subject area, would you find out that actually uh, it was during the period where the Moors had invaded Europe. They introduced some of all these educational concepts into Europe and even helped to build and establish institutions in Europe, in parts of Spain, um, that these concepts were then introduced into the, uh, to the European population. But there's no mention of that because the Europeans have gone through that decolonization process. They've removed any kind of resemblance or any kind of uh, memory of um, uh, you know the presence of uh, a foreign power on their soil, and now sought to now interject, uh, you know, concepts so, that are unique to them into their own curriculum. You know, so, so we should so, do we should go through that phase as well. So 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 language seemingly as you all are, as I'm listening mm. preserves um, memory, indig indigenous memory, perhaps that means memory of accomplishments, memory of a society, and memory of, of yourself. Um, it also obviously preserves certain philosophies. And I, I kind of want to go back to something that Ego said. He mentioned um, that the, the concept of good luck is, is not in Japanese, but the closest, um, the closest concept to that, if I'm pronouncing the word correctly, I think you said it was um, gambate, something of that sort, that means um, in Japanese, you know, try, try harder. So um, perhaps somehow or another, that obviously language is preserving certain philosophies and what you, what you think as a philosophy, you eventually translate that into action. So we've got pre preservation of language to to preserve memory, to uh, preserve philosophy, and therefore those help to dictate action. I wonder um, how language affects uh, the person's mental narrative about, about other people. And I wanna just set up a, a small scenario that I'd like for both of you all to uh, comment on. Suppose that I take together Benin and Nigeria. And I hope I'm not gonna be offensive to anybody, not, not on this panel, but I mean to our audience. If I, if I said that perhaps Benin is French Nigeria and Nigeria is British Benin, or if I picked another parallel and I looked at Ghana and Togo, and I say that Ghana can be thought of as British Togo, but Togo is French Ghana. Is it possible or how do you react for the question of why or how has language created strangers amongst neighbors? Are, are, are Ghana and Togo that are geographically neighbors, strangers to each other? 
uh, Benin and Nigeria, both neighbors, strangers to each other. I I'll let you all deal with that. Well, they, they, they are, first of all, they're, they're countries which didn't exist prior to the coming of um, of, uh, of, of the colonizers. Um, there was a loose loose fixation of peoples who intermingled and there were kingdoms uh, along them, all, all those coasts and routes. Um, there were no official borders. Um, so the imposition of those borders and then also the imposition of the languages has caused a, um, a disconnect between peoples, and in fact, on both sides of the borders, due to this language um, disconnect, you can now find people speaking different languages. Uh, for instance, the, the Yorubas in Nigeria and the Yorubas in, uh, in, in in Togo and even in Benin, um, but one speaks English, the other speaks French, and this hap has happened all over the continent. So uh, language is also used as, as a tool of um, disempowering people, separating people, the divide and conquer that we've always known. Um, and, and, and it's one that needs to be dis dismantled. Um, w w one thing I will say is, is in all the uh, Agenda 2063 uh, plans and, and, and everything you hear the AU Commission speaking about, I never hear of, of, the, of any official plan to, to deal with this. Um, obviously, we know about the EAC, the East African Federation, and a lot of countries on the East African uh, 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 region wanting to adopt Kiswa again, that's a very good thing. But this should be an African wide thing. It, the AU or Africa as a whole should have a decolonization uh, um, program. You should have a decolonization program from the school system all the way to universities, to the books, to the text, to the, to the, to the sign postings, everything, um, which is tantamount to a cultural revolution. But um, so far, we haven't seen this. Yeah, but you told me that. Yeah, but you told me that uh, some time ago that one of the reasons that the AU was off kilter is because they missed the cultural piece as a first uh, initiative for empowerment. That the, the 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 whole idea about the about the AU would be uh, from an economic uh, idea about even in, you know integrating the continent you know economically. They didn't start. With the idea that you had to piece together um, cultural relationships to build a foundation for economic and then uh, political integration. Yes, yes, I, I, I do believe that, and, and I think um, the 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 fact, the fact the fact that's also missed is this um, cultural revolution, this 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 decolonization um, process would boost. Um, um, the economy it will boost the economy because we'll be creating products that are uniquely ours. Right now, we are competing with already established powers in products that we're going to now brand with English writing um, for their markets in general because we are well mainly uh, an extractive industry right now. So if we're trying to sell, say we start producing cocoa uh, and we start now processing cocoa to break, make chocolates, Swiss are making chocolates and it's all branded in English. So you're now going up against them. Whereas you can have your own unique product that is selling to your own people. Whereas now, because everyone speaks English, they will buy a product that they can read in English and they can understand and they can get all the information. Same with drugs, same with uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, medication, everything in particular. Language is a tool for an economy, it's a tool for uh, economic expansion. And um, it's also a tool for integration. And as long as we are not focusing on it, uh, we're not going to be, we're missing the piece that's going to help us with our, with our economic um, um, and plans. Um, I, I wanted to uh, mention um, uh, uh, another book. I think Anandi has some book there from Amos Wilson that talks about this, um, especially in the education piece. Uh, there's a book called Development, Developmental Psychology of the Black Child by Amos Wilson, uh, where he talks about how um, you know, media and um, uh, some very innocuous things that you see around uh, around the home could impact the development of a child and, and keep their mind decolonized. Um, a child uh, reading books, as Nami said, that, that tell stories of uh, Mary had a little lamb, uh, um, three blind mice, uh, London Bridge is falling down, you know, and these are African children singing these songs or playing with dolls. 
that are that, that are European looking and, and constantly seeing themselves outside of themselves. And this starts from a very young age. This starts from childhood, growing up all the way. And then by the time you now get to uh, semi-adulthood, you now start becoming attuned to media. And then media now keeps bombarding you with images of, uh, of, of, um, of, of, of things that are outside yourself. But now you're fully integrated in that system. You speak the language, and then you teach it to the next generation. So. Um, there needs to be African-centered schools. Uh, so far, I have not come across one on the continent or any drive to one. I've come across a lot of people who are creating schools for Africans. Uh, we know Umar Johnson uh, and many others in the United States are creating uh, schools and institutions for black children in Africa um, with uh, African-American-centered uh, curriculum, but I don't know. Now, I don't know. What, 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 what do you think about those features and those schools? Something like what Dr. Umar, I think it's called the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey Academy, uh, and his, his idea is teaching uh, business about the black businesses, um, about uh, understanding the stock markets and things like that. But it's not the same thing that we're talking about, is it? It's not the same thing as an African-centered school uh, teaching you through your own historical antecedent. Uh, understanding of your, yourself, your consciousness, and your problem-solving skills and critical thinking skills. Yeah, we don't. We don't really have any. I, I can't really think of any any institution or any any country on the continent that has an African-centered um, curriculum that's you know just uniquely African. I don't think we have any any country on the African continent that has that. Uh, I think what um, the African American community has is more or less a, a curriculum that were developed for for Black people exclusively. Um, that's the HBC, HBCU institutions that were developed, and um, I think that's the closest in terms of the diaspora. That's the closest that we have to an African centered curriculum. And, and, uh, and elementary schools as well in the yeah, United States. Obviously, the elementary school, because uh, we can see how a, you know a lot of institutions were developed in, in America, um, HBC institutions like Lincoln, Howard, um, Tuskegee, the are those of HBC institutions, and um, that developed their own curriculum that was unique. I don't know if I, I can actually use the word African-centered, to describe how the curriculum for those institutions were like, but they were largely successful, and we can see uh, some of the products that those HBC, HBCU institutions produced. You know, the likes of Kwame Nkrumah, um, the likes of Nambia Zikiwe, the likes of um, Stokey Carmichael, um, the likes of um, uh, Maya Angelou. Uh, there were so many people, um, uh, Tahanisi Coates. Uh, so many people who who, who went to these HBCU institutions. I think after desegregation, I think the the curriculum for this HBCU institution was slightly diluted. I don't know, maybe Barucci can talk more extensively about that, but in terms of um, an African-centered curriculum, the HBCU, the HBCU institutions that we have in the United States is something that comes close. I, um, I, I, yeah, I'd like to delve into a conversation on that, you know, for another show definitely on you know hbcus and their impact okay okay i uh, just two two quick questions I, I, I want to put to both of you so um since we don't have african central schools on the continent what do we do if if, if we had a as you call it magic wand see again magic wand wand <laughs> these things just come out and we just say them because that's how we do if we had our own way um what would what what would you suggest to be ban international schools? Uh, you said you said uh, on that question about banning international schools. Yes, foreign schools on the continent uh, because we don't, we, we, we don't we don't have any any ones uh, elsewhere. We don't have. Uh, African-centered ones, <laughs> any anywhere in, in in the West or anywhere else. When we're not expanding, uh, mm -hmm. first of all, we, we need to have our own center schools in the first place before we're able to proliferate elsewhere. So, 
it, is it a threat? Is well, it a threat having these schools to continue to perpetuate um, uh, um, their consciousness on, on, on our soil? That's the first question. The second question is, what are the benefits now? Um, just around, what are the benefits of uh, decolonizing uh, the African mind? What benefits can we see? And how, how far can and extensive can, can they go? Well, let me take the last one first. Okay. I mean, the benefits of decolonization of, of, of the mind is that we're going to recenter our narrative upon ourselves. So that means that we're constantly looking for solutions from our own genes. We may look at what other people have done in their spaces for solutions to certain problems, but we immediately customize and adapt uh, solutions from outside onto our spaces. And we think of our own uh, solutions that work too. We learn to love each other and to see each other as resources in our immediacy uh, and in our adjacency and beyond that. So what I'm talking about here is within African countries per se, within neighboring countries and within the diaspora, as we begin to see each other as resources, then more ideas about solutions, you know, will be will be helpful. So a recentering of our narrative about love of self, our ideas about we can create solutions to our own problems using each other as, as resources. Regarding the, the, the ban on the international schools, everything may have to be a, a process, maybe take some things that are good about the international schools and, uh, and then incorporate them into schools that, that we would have so that we you know, keep the dialogue going um, in conversation about what we come up with, what other people come up with that might be useful to our um, empowerment. However, when, when it comes to um, the indigenous schools on the continent that would have an African-centered curriculum, I think that a lot can be borrowed from some aspects of the uh, Afrocentric schools in the United States and also the HBCUs as well to borrow from them to be used as curricular uh, resources on the continent. Perhaps what also needs to be done is the, the infrastructure of some of the HBCUs on the, in the United States uh, where possible should be expanded onto the continent. So it's no reason that we can't take some of the HBCUs of, of note, Howard University, Florida a &M, North Carolina a and Tuskegee uh, University, and it's no way, it's, it's not, to me, it's a no-brainer that we can take some of these schools and they can establish campuses in different African countries so that we can link the, um, the research capabilities, we can re relink the, um, the interface between African peoples on the continent and the diaspora, and that would also facilitate the notions that I mentioned uh, before about uh, us centering a narrative where we learn to uh, love each other, we learn to interact with each other in a variety of spaces and begin to see each other as resources on different levels. You're mute, you're mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I was saying, um, I remember another conversation we had about uh, the famous author, um, famous Nigerian author, uh, um, Professor Chiwonzo. No, 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 not Chiwonzo. Um, the late, oh goodness, his name is called uh, Chinua Chepe, sorry. Oh, yeah, Chinua yeah. And his famous book, Things Fall Apart. Uh, you, you, you were telling me that, um, that, that book has been translated into many, many, many. Uh, languages except his own. Except Igbo, yeah. Except Igbo. Uh, I, I, ironically, Chinua uh, Chewe uh, and Ungu um, Viwationgo, uh, they had that conversation, I think, when they met in Makerere University in 1965. And um, obviously, Ungu Viwationgo was your opinion as part of the uh, linguistic approach to decolonization that, um, you know, Africa should explore 
the, poss the possibility of using indigenous languages as a form of education in our institution. That was a position that Ngugi Wation would choose. But uh, Chiu and Chibi was of the opinion that, okay, fine, even if, for example, for example now, Ngugi Wation is, 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 is Kukui, and Kukui is an ethnic group in, in, in Kenya. So Chiu and Chibi was of the opinion that, okay, if he spoke Kukui and him spoke Igbo, how would they understand each other? So he saw rather the benefits of um, the, uh, the colonial language as a form of education. So Chiwan Chiwa was the opinion that we use the colonial language as a tool to express ourselves and highlight the challenges, uh, you know, the challenges that we face on the continent and use that as a language to fight uh, 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 colonialism or, or, or imperialism and uh, hide, address some of the challenges that we have to a much wider audience and use that as a tool for communication. That was um, Chiwan Achille's own position. He was looking at the benefits of using those languages as a, as a tool to reach a much wider audience. So not just only people within the continent, but globally. But the irony is that now that he's dead, his book you know, has over 50, has been translated to over 50 languages. And yes. none of those languages is, is in Igbo, which is his native tongue. It's, it's, ama it's amazing that um, both of you gentlemen would, would bring up uh, Chinua Achebe. Hmm. During the course of, of the program, believe it or not, um, I, I actually looked up a statement by Chinua Achebe. And um, sometimes I try to end our shows with a, you know, an actual proverb that may parallel the discussion. But I saw an interesting statement by Chinua Achebe that I had, had written down. So you guys, we must be on the same page, ESP or whatnot. Um, but, you know, a, a proverb in my mind is, uh, is kind of like indigenous wisdom, you know, to a particular community. And here's a statement by Chinua Achebe. Chinua Achebe said, proverbs are the palm oil with which words are eaten. Exactly. Exactly. And um, yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll just close close it out with. Um, I think we're way overdue. We're, we're, there's a lot of focus on the economic aspect, you know, linking Africa together, science and the guns, the Africa we want. Uh, infrastructure development, political uh, um, issues, um, government or despots or dictators who are overstaying their time, uh, f f f uh, Franco uh, echo, francophone West Africa, and all these things. But there's some underpinnings that really address a lot of all these situations. Decolonizing the African mind, decolonizing of, of the self in looking within and looking into our untainted part of our history for our solutions is pretty much the the core of what we should be focusing on, not all these other uh, aspects. We should deal with everything else for sure. But China, I believe, has only gotten to where they are because they are pulling from their historical context and their history and their culture. And you cannot defeat that. But when you're only thinking and using the, the framing and the mindset and context of someone else, they know the traps and the, and the pitfalls and the real deep meaning of the things that you're trying to ex ex expose, and they can easily defeat you. We have to go back and take our own armory and use that because they can't defeat us that way. Um, and I'll leave it right there. So um, thank you all for watching. Uh, uh, thank you for commenting. Uh, really appreciate it. And um, tune in next time for the next show. Yeah, and uh, thank you all very much. I, as always, I, I enjoy it from our discussion um, and conversation tonight. I guess it's um, CNN Bantu style. <laughs> like, share, and subscribe. Peace. Peace.